Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. Not only what Jesus taught and the apostles taught, but what we find in the Old Testament, because it, the Old and New Testament come together, it is one whole unit. Now, we've been covering about the Passover and unleavened bread. We've already covered concerning the beginning of the Passover in Egypt. Now we're going to look at the next feast, which comes the next day. The Passover is on the 14th day of the first month. Then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now there's a reasons why it is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There are reasons why for the Old Testament and for the New Testament. And as I have said, and you will learn, God did not do away with any of these things. He took what he gave to the children of Israel, all 12 tribes, and he gave them the physical understanding of the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread and the rest of the holy days. Now, for the New Testament church, he has elevated and raised everything to a higher spiritual standard. And that higher spiritual standard then retains all the days, but with new meaning. But before we understand the new meaning for the New Testament, that we have to understand what was the meaning of these days in the Old Testament. Now, let's come here to Leviticus 23 again. And of course, we understand that these commands are here, but we will also see that every one of these days have been kept in the New Testament. So hold on, we'll get there. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you, you know, well, those are done away. So we're free to choose what we want to do, and if we think it's a good idea, we'll do it. What does that sound like? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Jesus said that I always do the things which please the Father. And he did not do one thing that the Father had not commanded him. And remember, Jesus was the Lord God of the Old Testament, who was the Messiah, the Savior of the New Testament. So you can't have one without the other. You can't say, oh, I'm going to follow the New Testament. Well, if you do, and just the New Testament alone, all right. Then you're going to have to get yourself some really sharp scissors and special razor knives. So that as you go through the New Testament, you're going to have to say, oh, this is in the Old Testament. Let's cut that out. Now, if you did that, Guess what you would find? Not only have you removed the Old Testament completely, but you have removed one-third of the New Testament, which are quotes from the Old Testament. So you see, anyone who believes the lie, and it is a lie, I don't care how nicely a minister may say, if you bring up to him concerning the Sabbath and he looks at you and says, or the priest, and he looks at you and says, my child, we don't have to do these things today. Jesus released us from the curse, which is the law. Well, the law is perfect, not a curse. The curse of the law is sin and still is in the New Testament. Sin is the transgression of the law. So, Let's come back here to Leviticus 23, and let's read concerning the next feast, which starts the very next day after the Passover. Passover is on the 14th day of the first month. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is on the 15th day of the first month, the next day. 
And remember in the Bible, days are calculated from sunset to sunset. Now, what is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and why does it follow right afterwards? And we also find there are two holy days in this feast, the first day and the seventh day. And the feast in Toto is seven days long. And we will look at that, and we will understand the reason why for the Old Testament, and we will understand the reason why with the New Testament. All right. Let's read verse 5 again. In the fourteenth day of the first month between the two evenings is the Lord's Passover. On the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. Now, why would God require something like that? Well, we will see. There's a great lesson in the New Testament. But he did require it. Let's read on. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, meaning it's a holy day. You shall not do any servile work therein. That means you're not to be out working for what your regular job is. Now we'll see a little later that there are certain things that you can do on the first holy day in the way of preparation of food for observing the day. And then it says, verse 8, but you shall offer a fire offering to the Lord seven days, and the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. All right? When we come to Exodus, the 12th chapter, we have some more explanation for it. That's why we only have a summary here. Because in order for them to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread— and isn't it really, really interesting, how everything brought out here concerning the holy days of God, we find in the Bible. However, you can't find one positive thing about the holidays of this world. They are all soundly and roundly denounced and condemned by God and commanded that we do not do those abominations. So let's come here to... Exodus 12 again, and we will pick it up concerning the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, as we covered in the segment concerning the Passover, the Passover lamb was selected on the 10th day of the month and kept up until the beginning of the 14th. And remember, sundown begins and ends a day. So as the sun was setting, that was ending the 13th day, and when it disappeared below the horizon, that was the beginning of the 14th day. Now, when the 14th day came around to end 24 hours later, at sundown on the 14th, that began the 15th. So this is why it is explained this way in Exodus, the 12th chapter. Verse 15, God says, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days. Even the first day you shall have put away leaven out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now, how is that going to happen? That means that God cuts them off from understanding, cuts them off from the blessings that he gives for obedience. In the first day there shall be a holy convocation. In the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation. No manner of work shall be done in them except that which every man must eat. That only may be done by you. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Now, God does everything with meaning and purpose. What was the meaning and purpose of the Passover? because God passed over the houses of the children of Israel and spared their firstborn. That's the meaning of the Passover in the Old Covenant. Now, the meaning of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread also has a fantastic meaning. And it goes back, as you will see if you read in the book, The Day Jesus the Christ Died, goes back 
to the promise of Abraham that God gave to him as found in Genesis 15, that he would bring the children of Israel out of the land of their captivity. Verse 17, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Question, what does it mean you shall keep? Does that mean do away? Now, we'll just jump forward a little sidebar ahead of time here, a little forecast into the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, the apostle Paul said, Christ, our Passover, because he was crucified on the Passover day, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, and he means of unleavened bread, not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's the New Testament command to keep the feast of unleavened bread. And as we will learn, leaven becomes a type of sin in the New Testament. So let's read on here in Exodus 12. Here's the reason why they were to keep the feast. For in this very same day, I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep this day in your generations as a law forever. Now, does day and night still exist? Does the calculated Hebrew calendar still exist? Answer is yes. Did Jesus keep those days? Yes. Did the apostle keep those days? Yes. Did the New Testament church keep those days? Yes. So you see, when you put it all together, you get a complete picture. All right. Now, here are the instructions, verse 18. Now, this becomes just a little tricky unless you understand that sunset ends the day. Let's read it here. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at sunset, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at sunset. Hold your place right here, and let's get a biblical interpretation that it means here, sunset at the end of the fourteenth day, beginning the fifteenth day. Now, in Leviticus 23, we find a definition on how to keep the Sabbath defined for us in the instructions concerning the Day of Atonement. Now, we'll get to the understanding of the Day of Atonement here in a little bit as we go through the holidays of this world and the holy days of God, because this is going to take probably as much room and time on church at home as we did with the kingdom of God. I think we had 21 segments on the kingdom of God, and that was just scratching the surface. You see, the word of God is wide and broad and deep and high and filled with meaning and detail and interlacing connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word of God, the commands of God, the spirit of God, the love of God, and all of these things. Because you see, the The Bible is, you can consider like a sphere, and it so agrees with itself that it's like taking a sphere and having lines intersect it, and you can have an infinite number of lines intersecting, and they all connect and work together as part of the whole. So likewise with this. Now, verse 32, concerning the Day of Atonement, because this gives us a specific definition where we understand when a day begins and a day ends, and that is sunset. Now, the Day of Atonement is specifically, according to the calculated Hebrew calendar, the seventh month and the tenth day. So, the tenth day of the seventh month. So let's see how God defines a day from sunset to sunset. This will clear up the mystery of Exodus 12. Now, virtually all other translations have it incorrect. That's why you need the Holy Bible in its original order. 
we have corrected all of the errors of the King James Version of the Bible, all the errors of the New King James Version of the Bible, because we've gone back to the original to translate it correctly with no committee, with no lobbying groups, no atheists, no Catholics, no Protestants, but we stuck to the Word of God, the truth of God, and those dedicated, honest scholars who were righteous enough to maintain the truth of God in spite of what is taught by nominal and orthodox Christianity. So let's read it here, verse 32. It, that is atonement, shall be to you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls. That means fasting. Now notice the next sentence, in the ninth day of the month at sunset. And what does that do? That ends the ninth day. From sunset to sunset, you shall keep your Sabbath. Therefore, since it the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It defines it for us this way. When the sun sets on the ninth day of the seventh month, that ends the ninth day and begins the tenth. When the next sunset comes around to end the tenth day, that ends the tenth day and begins the eleventh day. So therefore, from sunset to sunset, you shall observe your Sabbath. Now, come back here to Exodus, the 12th chapter. Now, I know that for some people this may be a little difficult to understand, but you see, you need to think on how the Bible presents it, not how you view things from the past. So here, Exodus, the 12th chapter. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at sunset, which ends the 14th and begins the 15th. You shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at sunset, and the 21st day ends the seventh day. All right, now can we count? We'll see the seven days. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Seven days, inclusive counting. So when the Passover day ends at sunset, it begins the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover is from sunset of the 13th, beginning the 14th, to the sunset of the 14th, beginning the 15th. Likewise, with all the holy days. But you will find that these verses here clarify the understanding of it like no other Bible does. Now let's continue on with the instructions for unleavened bread. And of course, we should do this today. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7 concerning putting leaven out of their houses and also putting sin out of their lives. Verse 19, seven days there shall no leaven be found in your houses, for whoever eats that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. We'll see there's another purpose to the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread here in just a minute. Let's come over here and let's see why they took the unleavened bread, because it was flat, and you could pack it up in your satchel to carry it with you, and you could keep it that way, and then when you stop to eat and take a break, then you could quickly have a piece of unleavened bread. Or if it were the dough and you were stopping overnight and you had a fire built and you could quickly eat it. All right, so let's pick it up. Moses called for the elders and gave them all the instructions. 
And it came to pass at midnight, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive that was in the prison, also all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And during the night he sent word to Moses and Aaron, saying, because what did Moses say when we first started this before the Passover? Moses told Pharaoh, your servants are going to come down to me and say, get out. Well, that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh didn't go down there and say, get out. That's nonsense. He sent word to Moses and Aaron, rise up, get away from my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And the Egyptians were urging the people that they might send them out of the land quickly, for they said, we're all dead men. I guess so. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up into clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they asked for articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing from the Egyptians. And then it says that God gave them favor and they were literally throwing the gold and throwing the silver and throwing the raiment to them so that the children of Israel, according to the word of God and his promise to Abraham, would leave the land of their captivity with great substance. That's exactly what happened. Is the word of God true? Did it happen? Of course it did. Now, let's come down here to verse 40, and let's understand something concerning the night of the 15th as it began. Remember, sundown ended the 14th, began the 15th. That day, beginning the 15th, was the day that God began taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. See, on the day portion of the, of the 14th, because they were to stay in their houses until dawn, then after dawn, they all gathered at Ramses. And Ramses is where the Exodus began. And let's ask the question, does God keep his promises? Yes. Does he do it on time? Yes. Does he do it on the day that he said he would do it? Yes. So let's read it. Verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, it was even on the very same day, all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And that was the day that God had promised to Abraham he would do it in Genesis 15. Now, if you get the book, the day Jesus the Christ died, you will see a full explanation of that and what it was that God did with Abraham and what a fantastic thing that took place there. And how it was also a prophecy of the coming death of the Lord God of the old covenant, the one who became Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh. And it was done on the 14th day and the 15th day, and that is a fantastic and marvelous thing to understand. Now, future sidebar. That's why Paul wrote, if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Now, you see why you can't do away with the Old Testament? You have to understand it. And you have to learn what there is to learn here. Now, notice verse 42. This is how we are to start observing and rejoicing in God's deliverance from sin and slavery. It is called the night to be much observed to the Lord. Let's read it, verse 42. 
It is a night to be much observed to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed by all the children of Israel in their generations. Now, let's understand something very important here. Passover pictured God passing over the houses of the children of Israel and sparing the firstborn and executing his judgment against all the gods of Egypt. The next night, after they had gathered at Ramses on the day portion of the Passover day, they began the exodus. A million six hundred thousand or eight hundred thousand people, all ready to go at the command of God on the very day, to the very time, to the very hour that God had promised he would deliver them when he gave the covenant and promise to Abraham in Genesis 15. Now that's something. This was a vast army. And that is really quite a thing for us to understand. Now, you need this book, Lord, What Should I Do? If your life is in turmoil about what you should do, where is God, who is God, what is happening in the world, how should I live my life, where should I begin to find God? Well, you get that book and read it, and you will understand the place to begin is right in your own home. That's why church at home. And right now, especially since the gas prices have gone up, that's the best place to keep church at home because Jesus gave the promise wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So you don't have to worry about, well, uh, why am I not around lots and lots of people? Well, one of the reasons is you need to be educated in the Bible first before you can be around those who understand and know these things. And we have fellowship groups and we have things like that, and we have congregations and churches. Though we're small, we're growing. God is adding to us constantly. Now, I would like also to mention to you that you can, for a donation, and this is the only thing that we require a donation on, is the Holy Bible in its original order, a faithful version with commentary. Not only does it give the best English translation in the world, but it also contains commentaries and appendices and instruction all about the Bible. How did we get it? How did it come about? And also, in its original order, it structures the Bible in the way that God intended it to be structured. You have the structure of the Bible this way. The Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Three divisions for the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, the fourth one, and isn't that interesting, because number four is the day of the week that God set all the, the sun and moon and stars for appointed times, and the fourth day of the week is Wednesday, and in the middle of the week, that's when Jesus Christ was crucified. So it's fitting that the fourth division of the Bible is the Gospels and Acts. The fifth division of the Bible are the general epistles. That is, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Then the sixth division of the Bible are all the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And the seventh division is one single book, the book of Revelation. And you need all the Bible to understand the book of Revelation. It's all explained in the commentary. And this is why you need this Bible. And if you found the Bible difficult to read and understand, this Bible will solve that problem for you. So you go right to our home page, and there is a place where you can order the Bible. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home. So until next time, this is Fred Coulter saying, so long, everyone.